Um, with Mr. Casper Bowden, uh, known to uh, many of you uh, from previous events, uh, Mr. Bowden has uh, prepared a study for the European Parliament, which you find on your desks, uh, with the title The US Surveillance Programs and Their Impact on EU Citizens' Fundamental Rights. Um, he will give a short introduction to the, uh, to the paper, and then we'll open the floor to you're not going to give a short, you're going to give a long introduction to your paper. I'm not going to give an introduction at all. I'm going to assume members have read it. That's a wild assumption. <laughs> okay, Mr. Bowden. Well, maybe, you know, just for the benefit of those of us who've not read it, uh, you know, I have, of course. Um, but just for, you know, the, f the few people who have not read it, um, you could give a very, very, very short introduction or a summary of, let's say, two, three minutes. Uh, some of the main uh, conclusions, uh, you know, some of the topics are well known to some of us, but not to all. And then we'll open the floor to uh, uh, questions and debate. Well, with permission, I've decided not to take that approach. Uh, I did give us many of these issues in February. Uh, this report is designed to be self-contained and as concise as possible. So well, the approach I tend to take is more forensic. What I'd like to do is actually go through the text, calling attention to particular issues that I think the committee might wish to pay further attention to, just in case, as it were, when they reflect and read this at leisure, uh, those points go by. There are some quite significant points buried within, and I think that might actually be more productive. Of course, some, will, some things will get lost in that approach, but I think that will actually be more efficient use of time than simply trying to restate mm -hmm. and recompress what is already there. Okay, that's fine. Well, you know, the floor is yours, and you decide how, how you do it. Um, we have about 15 minutes, and then we do question and answer. Well, first of all, I'd like to say how grateful I am to the Parliament for the opportunity and the Commission to prepare this report. Uh, the scope of this report is solely on the activities of the United States and the National Security Agency. There is obviously linkage between the activities of the United States and the National Security Agency and uh, one particular member state, but I haven't explored that in this report. Uh, just a few other preliminary remarks. Uh, I know that I'm billed always as the former Chief Privacy Advisor of Microsoft just to dispel any possible uh, uh, misconception that there is really no alignment between my views and that of Microsoft, if anyone was in a, under that impression. Um, so, uh, excuse me, the, um, I think that the first observation I'd like to make goes actually uh, as a more general observation to something that Mr. Bronze said earlier, that uh, perhaps there is a view that it's the uh, collection of data is less important than the use and I think I disagree with that. And the reason I disagree with that, I want to illustrate in this way. Since the Snowden revelations, public opinion now understands that persons of influence in society, politicians, journalists, people in any organizational hierarchy, know that the National Security Agency is likely to know any personal secret which they have committed to an electronic medium perhaps over the past 10 years. We don't know how long this data is stored. So to jump in at the deep end, I think this creates profoundly dangerous destabilizing factors in democracy because it means that public opinion now has to consider are the people of influence in society, as it were, looking over their shoulder, thinking, second guessing, oh, maybe I'd better not write that letter. Maybe I'd better soften my approach. Maybe I'd better not do something which is against the interests of US foreign policy. Because if those secrets, those embarrassments, those points of leverage on persons of influence in society, even if they don't exist, if the public believes they might exist, this is something, a transition, if you like, which has already happened. And I don't think this has been sufficiently factored in because of the scale of the Snowden event. We've never had a disclosure of secrets like the Snowden event. Another general prefatory remark is there are known to be still tens of thousands of documents in the Snowden material which have not been written about and have scarcely been analyzed. So it's entirely possible that uh, the subject matter which is written about in this report will be dwarfed, in fact, by subsequent revelations. The approach I've taken in preparing the report was to try and fuse together historical and contextual policy information to give, uh, to give some sense of perspective 
with the up to the minute revelations that have been happening over the past two months and to weave those together. So on page eight, the first, uh, I think, theme I'd like to draw to the committee's attention is something very fundamental that's often overlooked. Uh, it's in the section marked privacy governance, and it's really to do with the way that data protection law works. If one takes a long perspective, then there's something rather odd about data protection law in that it takes away a sort of fundamental power, if you like, from the individual. Once data is submitted to somebody else's system, whether that's a government system or a private sector system, the individual can really no longer object when that data is copied. If that data is copied to a thousand machines within one organization, or if that data is copied onto a thousand different organizations or into another legal regime, it is an assumption that if the right legal boxes have been ticked, well, the individual just has to put up with that. But it's sort of obvious, and it's true, that every time data is copied from one system to another system, the privacy risk is increasing, strictly increasing. It never decreases, because the risk that something bad will happen to that data and that something bad will happen to the individual as a result of that happening to that data is always going to increase. Now, this is a long-held assumption in data protection law going back 40 years. But I think the Snowden events and the developments in cloud computing particularly we ought to be asking some rather fundamental questions about the intellectual basis for data protection law. Uh, moving through the report, uh, I'd next just like to dwell on the section on page 13 on X key score. Uh, X key score is, is, uh, is, a, is an indexing and searching system. Uh, it involves a three day rolling buffer of the full take of data stored at 150 global sites on 700 database servers. And it indexes email addresses, file names, IP addresses, port numbers, cookies, web mail and chat usernames, buddy lists, phone numbers and metadata from web browsing sessions, and so forth. So that description is rather flat, but when one dwells on the immensity, the immense power, surveillance power of that capability, it's something that we've never really dreamt of before. It's something Orwell did not foresee. It means that data can literally be plucked out retrospectively in time. It gives the analyst a kind of time machine. So without any prior suspicion about an individual, it's possible to go back and examine the conduct and behavior of anybody in the world, uh, except, of course, Americans to a limited degree that we'll come on to. So the next point of interest, I think, is about Bull Run on page 14, which is the code name for the NSA program for the last decade, to, to break into widely used encryption systems, probably not directly by mathematical techniques, uh, but using things like side channel attacks, uh, electronic emanations from uh, the computer through which the key can be reconstructed, and also through uh, perhaps suborning or co-opting manufacturers of security systems and equipment. Now, this has created the most shock amongst the technical security community and everywhere in the world. Analysts and security specialists are now trying to guess and reconstruct which systems may be vulnerable and re-key or upgrade those systems. But they're working in the dark. And uh, from talking to some of the journalists who have had access to this material, I have not, um, we can't expect there to be very much more specific detail to come out about that. So we have an immediate problem, which is we know a large number of the systems that we thought three months ago were secure. We know a large number of those are not secure, but we don't know how to find out which ones. Uh, moving through, uh, the next point of interest, I think, is about uh, foreign intelligence information on page 18. Foreign intelligence information is the core term of art underlying the PRISM program. It was first defined in the 1978 Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and the part that I'm interested in here has not actually changed since 1978. To get the little uh, italicized text, you have to substitute two levels of definition in what is rather a complex formulation, and this, if you like, only represents one-tenth of the full definition of foreign intelligence information. But it is worth dwelling on, and I'll read it in full. It is information with respect to a foreign-based political organization or foreign territory that relates to 
or if concerning a US person is necessary to the conduct of the foreign affairs of the United States. So that is an immensely broad definition. That really means that any data of assistance to US foreign policy is eligible, including expressly political surveillance over ordinary, lawful, democratic activities of citizens in European Union countries. Now, we don't know to what extent that definition is applied because a curious fact is there has been nothing written at all about that in 40 years. There has been no legal commentary, there has been no published guidance, there is no executive orders elaborating what that means. It is simply unknown what effect that has been put to over the past 40 years. But the supposition is that this would be the power under which uh, purely political surveillance of activities in a foreign country, counter-espionage possibly, uh, but essentially political spying would be conducted. Now, there is in this definition, you will notice, a discrimination by nationality. If this was concerning a United States person, the criteria would be necessity, a very, very strict legal threshold. But if it's not a US person, it merely relates about the, legus, the weakest legal threshold one can imagine. And when we come on to look at the 702 power, that also contains an express discrimination by nationality. So when you apply the two together, there is what I call a double discrimination by nationality, favoring American citizens and disfavoring everybody else. Now, I don't think there is anything in European law remotely like that. In fact, from, I haven't included a human rights analysis in this work, but talking to human rights experts, they would regard that as simply and obviously unlawful under the European Convention. Um, there is, in fact, also, I'll just mention this briefly, in Section 215, uh, Greg Nogem was discussing uh, the U.S. trend to focus on trying to reform the Patriot Section 215 power. Well, the reforms that are being discussed in the U.S. actually are going to not help us very much, and they're certainly not going to help us if the part I've called attention to here remains intact, which is that apart from the counter-terrorist justification, there is also this very broad purpose to collect foreign intelligence information not concerning a U.S. person. So that is, if you like, a carte blanche to apply the 215 power to foreigners. So if they restricted the selective collection of information according to the counterterrorism criteria, but don't fix that, it won't do us any good. Uh, I want next to go on to page 21. And when we uh, consider the collection of foreign intelligence information under the PRISM program, which is based on the Section 702 power, uh, there is the statute to work with, and the statute says that there are minimization and targeting procedures. And when I wrote my analysis of this power for the report last year in cloud computing when presented this to LIBA in February, I never expected to see those minimization and targeting procedures, but indeed they were published unredacted in full by The Guardian on the 20th of June. So when one reads them, what one finds is that there is no limitation whatsoever or no protections whatsoever for non-US persons. It is, frankly, as I had expected and predicted. So this is a very strong confirmation that there are no uh, privacy protective powers or procedures in place for non-Americans. Uh, the next point on page 22 is to do with a disclosure that was made uh, just on August 21st, and it was actually a letter written uh, by, the by the US government to the leaders of the Congressional Intelligence Committees, and it has a particular uh, paragraph, which I've quoted there in italics, which is of great significance, I think, to this work, uh, the work of this committee and has not been commented on elsewhere. Now, what is going on here is after the National Security Agency has filtered the information it collects from the upstream systems and all the other systems we talked about, they apply this uh, attempt to make a 50% probability determination, is this data about Americans? And the data which they think is probably on that 50% basis about foreigners then continues in a kind of pipeline. Now, what this paragraph says is that pipeline can be split. So, for example, the CIA would get its own primary copy of that filtered data to work with and store and analyze and use for its own missions and, indeed, other members of the U.S. intelligence community. So, if we consider what material Snowden would likely have had access to, it may well be he did not have access to the kind of compartmentalized uh, exploitation guidelines for that 
CIA mission, for example. But it's highly significant that, if you like, in the agencies of the intelligence community can have their own copies of this data and then essentially work with that without restriction because it has already been filtered for foreignness. Uh, the next point I'd like to go on to is page 23, uh, just about uh, the general position with our instruments in data protection, which have tried over the years to prevent this, including safe harbor, BCRs for processes, uh, and of course now for cloud computing. Uh, and a general remark I would make, and of course it's central to the whole report, is there are loopholes. It appears to be the case that commission officials in the past 10 years have knowingly or unknowingly permitted these loopholes in the text. The loopholes are typically involving the phrase national security. Does it mean the national security of member states or does it mean the national security of the United States? And also another phrase that crops up is a legally binding request. And a legally binding request in US terms includes the full breadth of that foreign intelligence information, including the political purposes we have studied. So I suggest it will be important to the work of this committee to try and go back to some of the papers of the Commission from 10 or more years ago to actually analyze who made those decisions. Was it in good faith? Was there, as it were, bungling? Was there ineptitude? Was there complicity? And I think we should delve into that. Uh, I have said a little bit more, uh, perhaps with uh, less restraint than elsewhere in the report on the bottom, page 24. Uh, and if we go on now, please, to some of the recommendations. Uh, in making these recommendations, I'm conscious of the uh, Committee of Works have expressed an interest in reinstating Article 42 in particular. Uh, but before we get there, I have suggested the idea that things being now as we understand them, uh, European Union citizens are placing their data in jeopardy by using American web services and websites. There is already in the directive 9546 a requirement where the basis of processing is consent for that to be informed consent, informed of all relevant risks. So there is already a power uh, in existence to say that European Union citizens should be informed of the fact that if they use an American web service, their data is going to be subject to political surveillance by the United States. And I believe it would be salutary uh, for a strategic approach for this to be done. It would then make sure that European Union citizens were warned that if any material of political interest in the United States is in, contained in what they, uh, what they are doing, perhaps they better think twice. But of course, it's also designed to have a political effect on, I think, raising awareness and perhaps political solidarity within the European Union. It goes without saying from the rest of the analysis in the report that uh, the main mechanisms we have for export of data are not protective against Pfizer or Patriot. And so in particular, I don't see any case for allowing transfers under model contracts or safe harbor to continue. Uh, of course, diseng disengaging those will be a very, very serious matter and will have to be done in a phased way and in a strategic way. Uh, and also, to couple a strategic approach, it, it's going to be necessary and I think beneficial if we consider how to develop our own serious industrial policy for cloud computing, uh, a so-called European cloud. In dealing with that, when we get the further report on the activities of SIGINT within the European Union, of course, some member states are going to be in a problematic position. I'll say no more than that. So if we go on to consider the factors about Article 42, uh, there are some reservations which I would think we, we should consider on page 28. Um, the CEO of Yahoo recently said that if they had said more about the coercion that they were subject to in respect of 702, uh, she could have gone to jail for espionage charges for in fact up to 10 years uh, on the most obvious charge and perhaps, uh, depending on interpretation, uh, a penalty of up to 30 years or the death penalty. I'm not suggesting that's likely. I'm just suggesting that's what's in, in the US law. So against that uh, penalization, we are going to create a conflict of law with Article 42 where the penalty on the European side would be 2% uh, fine. Now, from my experience working in Microsoft, that, that is simply not going to work. So my proposal is that we should recognize that if a company fails to comply with the reinstated Article 42, we should make that a very serious criminal offense, at, at the least. And at the moment, the way the new regulation is structured, 
uh, there is really complete discretion for member states to, discover, to, to set the penalties for that kind of contravention. And I think it would be much better to be more explicit about making an explicit serious criminal offence in the new regulation. Also, the level of fines are going to be very, very inadequate. I've referred to a case which I think uh, I'm familiar with and a lot of other people will be, that Microsoft picked up a $1 billion fine in a competition case a few years ago to do with their monopoly over local area networking. However, the profits that Microsoft made over the decade which that uh, fine took to stick were probably around 20 billion, conservatively. In other words, a 20 to 1 mismatch between a cynical calculation of continuing with that business strategy and the fine they ultimately had to pay. Now, that's why I've recommended that to get a really effective uh, consideration of complying with the reinstated Article 42, we probably need to think about raising the fine, at least in that respect of that offence, 10 times to something like 20%. I mean, that may sound extraordinary, but all one can say is some of these companies have such enormous resources and deep business strategies, in my personal experience, that is really have to be considered. Now, the last point I'll make before questions is to say that since we know about Bull Run, the NSA project to subvert cryptography, cryptographic protection, but we don't know which ones, the scope of Article 42 at the moment would only apply to controllers and processors, but not vendors of security systems or vendors of equipment. So the idea is we could make Article 42 apply to them also. So if they were coerced by the NSA to put in a back door, even if they're not processing personal data, they have got to tell the European regulator that they've had to put in a back door. So we are creating a further conflict of law and further jeopardy and penalties for those companies if they choose to comply with US law rather than European law. So I will leave it there for questions, and I hope those specific points have been helpful for the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to start with our rapporteur, Claude Moraes. Okay, Mr. Bowden, first of all, Thank you. You've woken, I think you've woken everyone up at the, in this last session. I hope you have. That, that was excellent. Thank you. you we commissioned um, this report from you, and the reason we did it was that we needed a, a strategic evaluation of the whole area. This is a complex area. Not everyone is an expert on this area, and we need to do a, a strategic report at the end of this, which, although, as you admitted, um, this is a fast-moving uh, situation, where even if we make strategic uh, recommendations and evaluations, we may be um, superseded. Um, we need to do that at the end. And this is also a, an inquiry which is fairly short. But to do it, we need um, to have an overview of the area while we're doing the uh, inquiry. So you've done it in time that, so that we can do it. So even though colleagues have not read the report, um, I've forcibly read parts of it. Um, colleagues can read it as we go along and it will inform um, our situation and it will also mean that we can get up to speed on areas that we may not be up to speed on. So on page 27 you've done, you, you've set out strategic options for the Parliament. Now we have to end up with a report in this area and of course that will be a political balance so I'm not going to preempt anything. But one of the, the big recommendations, uh, I mean, I could ask questions on any part of this. I thought the immediate statement that you made was honest and clear, which I think um, the, the whole idea that whatever we're going to commit to the electronic medium is now going to be out there and it's going to have deep political implications, public life implications, but also for people in every area of, of life, that information can now be used. So that's very clear. All of these statements are very, very interesting. But let me just get to the nub of, of the kinds of recommendations that we're going to have to deal with. For example, in cloud computing. Now, if there's a FISA um, 702 request, for example, um, you're basically saying in this report that that's going to be taken. Um, so we need to get into European cloud computing. This is what basically you're, you're saying in this report. So the kinds of questions I have for you today so that we could at least make some progress in these areas, is there any chance of European cloud computing happening? You talk about, and, and I know in your Twitter feed and all your other um, discussions um, and writing, you talk about the Brazilian example where, I mean, this is beyond my mm -hmm. uh, understanding, but you talk about where the Brazilians are now, and Ana Gomez talked about um, that earlier, where they're talking about keeping the data within the country, 
keeping it within the, the confines of their sovereignty. How is that going to work? Um, and does that contradict what you just said, which is that if that happens, that this is just going to be superseded by some other uh, technology, or is it possible to have that within the confines of sovereignty? I want to ask you about um, other issues that you raised in the strategic options. You talked about encryption. We've already had evidence from Jacob Applebaum and other people about the encryption of, of information. The NSC and GCHQ, um, of course, want everyone to encrypt their information because that's the trigger for then going into the informa information. Again, you, I suppose you contradict everything by saying that's, you know, that's a technological area. I mean, are there any recommendations that you foresee in this report which deals with this whole technological area? Is there anything useful we are going to end up with in this parliament um, in the report which deals with these very difficult technological areas that's useful um, in this kind of field? I'm not going to keep going into these areas, but I want to give a taster of where this report is going to be useful for us because it deals both with the politics and the technology. And I think we're going to have to end up with a report in January 2014, uh, which can at least inform the next mandate as to as the sort of direction we're going to go in terms of the balance between privacy and security, mm -hmm. uh, but also dealing with the technology so that this report doesn't become out of date within weeks. Okay, thanks, Axel Voss. Vielen Dank. Um, also, zunächst einmal recht herzlichen Thank you very much indeed. That was very interesting. Now, what you said with regard to uh, the US authorities and the surveillance possibilities, does that also apply for the UK? Could you uh, apply that equally there? And when we're talking about the US and the UK, about a possible agreement, I don't think we could say uh, something similar with uh, the case of China or Russia. Have you had uh, uh, experiences uh, there? And then also you made reference to Safe Harbor and uh, the binding corporate rules. I thought it was quite uh, interesting uh, what you said about Article 42 and the possible penalties there. With Safe Harbour, we have this agreement with the US uh, and uh, with other countries who don't have such an agreement yet. So I wonder to what extent uh, Safe Harbour, well, I think. Uh, we would be willing to see how we could uh, make progress uh, with a further agreements that could set standards, perhaps. So I don't know if this could possibly uh, be useful with other countries where we don't have uh, such a system in place. Uh, if we look at China, for example, uh, every computer produced in China uh, has this spyware integrated. So you, you hear, hear these uh, these stories. Skip myself and speak last, Jan Albrecht. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your uh, comprehensive outline of uh, this very interesting study. I uh, think there are quite a lot of. Uh, things which could be further elaborated. I will concentrate on three issues. First is on the whistleblower protection, which you also put in um, as uh, an important recommendation also to us. Uh, this is something, of course, which we also have to discuss and where I would like to know um, which, which would be the, the real chances to get uh, infringements or unlawful behavior to public awareness um, and how could we regulate it in, in our privacy and data protection framework. That is a question which is uh, still not very concrete in my mind. And um, the second issue is on the uh, industrial 
policy for EU cloud, which you also line out uh, on page 27. I think that's something, if we talk about also the possibilities, how we can act uh, towards third states, of course there's much policy, much question about how, what can we do in law or uh, in other issues, but it doesn't change that obviously there is a threat which still we be in place. So is there a chance of a real EU cloud to be set up? Which, which issues would you see as the most pressing? And then last but not least, the question on the debates on the other side of the Atlantic, which is obviously uh, the most important on, for us in this regard at the moment. Are there movements which you can see with regard also to the U.S. Uh, policy debates, um, changes possibly where we can already uh, focus on and put pressure on the U.S. side to come forward because they tend to move or some of them tend to move. So if that would be the case, that would be very helpful to us as policymakers also in relation to our partners. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Ernst. Vielen Dank. Ich habe folgende Fragen. Uh, zum einen interessiert Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, questions I'd like to ask. I'm interested in general um, in law enforcement, penalties, sanctions, and so on. Are there, is there any thinking as of yet in the Parliament internally in terms of uh, current uh, penalties not being enough? Is there anyone thinking about tightening things up on the penalty side? Is there any prospect quantitatively or qualitatively to bring in more uh, binding uh, rules, as it were, or rules with more teeth? Now, secondly, um, no restrictions, or no holds barred when it's not Americans. The question then is where do we pitch the cross-border dialogue since this is so far-reaching and so um, such a, a profound uh, difficulty um, if it's such a stark difference, between, if, depending on whether you're Americans or non-Americans, um, can you really have a penalty which is going to make any impact? And how can you organize this between partners? Um, and then moving on to the whistleblowers, it says here, you say here, um, that something should be written into the regulations in terms of uh, protecting whistleblowers. Could you just elaborate on that? And then finally, on a European cloud computing system, I wouldn't claim to be an expert. I don't know how that would look, what it would look like. Um, and if the Europe did have, have a cloud computing system, what would it look like? Off the floor. Um, first of all, on, on um, a European cloud, I mean, that seems to be a kind of uh, uh, contradiction in terms. The whole idea of a cloud is precisely that it's, you know, it's, it's big. You make use of all the uh, potential capacity. And I'm, you know, I'm not a big fan of saying we're going to put a fence around Europe um, and, and you know, we don't want to make use of all the, uh, the, the new possibilities offered to us by technology. However, I do think that we should develop uh, a, a counterweight against the, the American dominance um, uh, on the market and make sure that we are, you know, we, we become more important and more powerful uh, in the clouds. Because frankly, and this is the question I'd like to put to you, even if we had a fence around Europe, we, we would have a 100% European cloud. That would not mean that the data are automatically out of reach of the Americans because um, you know, my, and we've been discussing this many, many times before, it's not only a technological issue, it's a legal issue. Because any company, let's say that we have a company which is part of a European cloud, but if it has an office, you know, even a broom closet uh, in the U.S., it is within U U.S. jurisdiction, but not only that broom closet, but any activity anywhere else in the world. So, you know, it's not just a, a, a physical problem. My second question, in your view, um, would it be possible for Europe, let's say for the European Commission, with the, making use of the existing data protection legislation to solve this problem? I think it would, actually. I think the Commission is being too timid and not, um, you know, not, not 
making full use of its, its powers because I think that current EU legislation, data protection legislation, um, would not allow for the kind of practices that we see. So we don't actually, I mean, new legislation would be better, would provide better protection, but in your view, uh, would current legislation um, uh, uh, also help? And my last question is, are you aware of uh, similar or identical laws um, uh, in, in, in EU member states, because I get the impression, I mean, sometimes when you, you blame the Americans for doing this, they say, aha, but you do the same. Um, so do we have similar laws in Europe? Thank you. <laughs> so I'll start with the cloud question, because that's a popular one. Um, I think I have tried possibly to anticipate a lot of the cloud questions we've had on page 32 in those points numbered 1, 2, and 3. And I'm going to sort of read out them because I do think they actually address some of these questions directly. Uh, the main, uh, if you like, fact of life about uh, data processed in cloud computing, this is where you have thousands of racks of computers in a warehouse that is actually crunching on data, doing calculations, rather than just using the cloud as a big disk drive just for storing data. Uh, is that you can only process data when it's decrypted. When data is encrypted, it just looks like random gobbledygook, and you can't even do sort of one plus one equals two. So the service provider, the cloud provider, has got to know the key. So even if the data is stored encrypted, when you actually want to do the calculation, the service provider has to have the key to decrypt the data, and then it's put into these great big banks of computers. At that point, it's vulnerable to a 702 order and there is no way out of this dilemma. Encryption is futile for cloud processing against the NSA. There are some highfalutin kinds of encryption which are literally billions of times too slow to be commercially relevant, and there is no sort of golden uh, <coughs> prospect in sight, in research, none at all. And frankly, uh, companies are rather shamelessly misleading about that in their marketing at the moment. So given that reality, the only defense is to keep that cloud data close, solely within your jurisdiction. Now, I also make the point that even though an EU-based cloud company, in point three on page 32, transacting in the US is in theory subject to a 702 order, in political terms, this is much less likely for two reasons. Firstly, the staff and management in that European firm, I think, would be much more likely to complain and to try and seek other ways of tipping off or going to European courts to object to raise legal issues from the European side. And secondly, uh, European staff are simply just not going to be as threatened by US Espionage, uh, Espionage Act charges. But on the other hand, you'll have to make a calculation, if you like, about uh, how many feet they've got in the US. Now, I won't name the company, but there is one very well-known, uh, possibly the major European company in this sector, and if you read their privacy statement, they say that they send their data to the US or they reserve the right to do so. So you need to look for a European company that frankly is, is, is taking a lot of steps to physically isolate the data but also legally isolate itself. But there is a big categorical difference between those two situations. The other point I, I think in this area generally is that there is a huge difference in terms of a technical security exposure between, shall we say, handing the data to the Americans on a plate and simply they're being able to open a fiber optic tap and get all of this data and search through the mass of it. There's an enormous difference in risk between that situation and having data physically within a European data center running on free software, which is much more scrutable uh, than proprietary software, and then the NSA having to break in, having to break in various layers of defense and then figure out how to extract that data physically and get that data back to the NSA. One you know, is like a pinpoint, pinprick attack. The other is literally handing the data over on a plate. Now, one fear I have is that the new regulation could actually make things worse because in way I've analyzed BCRs for processors, they are designed, the Commission's plan was to create an equivalence between those two situations I've just described. So it would be legally equivalent under new regulation to essentially export all this data, hand it to the Americans on a plate, and keep it inside Europe where it would actually be very relatively well defended against pinpoint attacks that you would then have to worry about. But according to the formulation of the new regulation, these situations would be treated as equivalent. And it's just 
obvious to a layperson, let alone a computer scientist, that these are far from equivalent in risk. So we have to fix that. And I've tried to point out very strongly uh, in this report that the regulation as drafted is fundamentally mistaken and has to be reformed. We have to reconsider particularly binding corporate rules for processes in the way it's formulated in the new regulation. Otherwise, we'll be actually making ourselves more vulnerable if we carry on as we are. Now, to turn to some of the other questions. Uh, let me just go back here. Uh, perhaps if I start uh, with Mr. Foss's question about uh, the situation with the US and the UK. I wasn't exactly sure what you meant by that, but certainly I haven't had any personal experience of, um, uh, of Russia or China in, in this area. Um, I, I don't even think perhaps I've looked at the Chinese law or the Russian law. The Russians have actually signed up to Convention 108 recently in the past six months, which is very interesting. Uh, but I'm not going to make any further comment about that, if I may. Um, regarding safe harbor, I think we have to look at safe harbor as being fundamentally broken. Uh, I had the opportunity in Washington, I was in Washington yesterday, of also meeting uh, the same re review group, uh, Obama's review group, uh, as Mr. Nemitz. And uh, I asked them if they wanted to keep that conversation confidential, and they said no. Um, so I will tell you my impression from meeting that review group uh, their verbatim words were that they regard safe harbor as a purely commercial agreement and they don't see any restriction under safe harbor for accessing that data for the full breadth of national security and foreign intelligence purposes. They see that as being their understanding of the deal. So we have to ask, how is it 13 years ago in Europe we made such a colossal mistake? How is it that we could have been so fundamentally deluded or misled or what went wrong? We really need to know that so we don't make the same mistake again. So I regard Safe Harbor as dangerous and unfixable and frankly not a, mo a model for anything that we want to do in future. Uh, if I go back to Mr. Murray's question uh, about, uh, I think I've already talked about um, Oh, yes. Well, there is this phrase that's now put around, and particularly thinking about the Brazilian situation, uh, of balkanization. Are we going to balkanize the Internet? This also cropped up in the remarks of Mr. Cameron Kerry uh, of the U.S. Department of Commerce in a speech a month ago. I think this is um, a red herring, to be honest, because when nobody's here is talking about a censorship, a censorship situation where we're talking about compulsory restricting uh, the access to data by European citizens, Instead, what we're talking about is creating facilities uh, and businesses and services locally in Europe and inviting European Union citizens to use them. There's no compulsion. It's choice. If somebody wants to send their data hanging out there in range of the NSA, no one's talking about stopping that under individual self-determination with informed consent. However, uh, what I would like to see happen is to stop, put a stop to the way in which whether it's a government organization or a private sector organization, once they've got your data on the basis of a frankly unintelligible privacy statement, they can decide to send it within range of the NSA without you knowing any more about it. That I think we should put a stop to uh, with a much clearer consent process. But this idea of balkanizing, it's, it's a red herring because the censorship, the great firewall situation is not what anyone is proposing here. We're simply talking about building up European capacity so that individuals can make more informed choices. Uh, oh, and uh, yes, the encryption point, I mean, I think is a very severe one because um, the, certainly the ways in which we would think about building defense in depth and using encryption uh, up until three months ago, or at least up until the bull run revelations, we're in a very parlous condition because I think the, the leading security experts still think that the fundamental techniques work, the fundamental cipher algorithms have not been broken. But uh, there was a case just which emerged last two weeks where the leading vendor of uh, security solutions possibly in the world, uh, RSA Laboratories, it turned out that their, uh, their leading product for authentication was based on a random number generator which now we know was nobbled by the National Security Agency. And they came clean and said, don't use our product. Don't use the things which you've actually been promoting for the last five or six years. 
So it's very early to try and read the runes, but if there is a trend here, I think there is much more safety and security in free and open source software and increasingly free and open source hardware. It looks as if the greatest risk of compromise and subversion of encryption products has been in mainstream proprietary commercial vendors where perhaps there's been a little bit too much uh, uh, accommodation and cozy relationships with the National Security Agency. Um, th this isn't a panacea, but I mean, if I had to put my money on it, I would say always favor free and open source uh, solutions and increasingly in hardware. So with that proviso, essentially we need to carry on doing the same sorts of security architecting that we've always been doing, but we just need to be much more suspicious about the products and the particular uh, stacks of software that we're using. Okay. And what else have I forgotten? Or shall I look? We have another round. Uh, yeah. I'll try and wrap. If I have forgotten anyone's point, please come back. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. That brings us to the second round of questions. I have three requests for the floor. Mrs. Romero Lopez, um, Mr. Weidenholz, and Mrs. Morvai. Any other requests? No? Then it will be those three. Mrs. Romero Lopez. Gracias. Gracias, señor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bowden, for coming again. If you recall, uh, we met uh, when uh, we presented uh, amendments on the uh, data protection law, and we were trying to take care of some of the problems uh, that uh, the cloud presented uh, regarding obligations of subcontracting, because the service providers have their companies that they contract with uh, uh, there are cloud companies uh, uh, because we don't really know where they are, if I can call them that way. Uh, is it possible for these cloud companies uh, to also be obliged to fulfill the same regulations as the uh, the main contractors? Would that be one way of uh, controlling these cloud companies because we don't know to what extent uh, this would be a response or not or if it's a sufficient response uh, because it's something uh, that we would have to deal with in Europe as well. We might have a lot of cloud companies as well but they would have to be covered by the same regulation. Secondly, with respect to Article 42 of the anti fees uh, clause. This summer we were hearing a lot about the power of the companies and even Mrs. Redding uh, mentioned how difficult it is uh, uh, to get uh, the explicit consent. Uh, if we have uh, difficulties uh, with this aspect of data protection uh, under explicit consent. Well, obviously, in Article 42, we're going to have even further difficulties. So my question is, it, given the current draft of Article 42, is that enough uh, to uh, cover what you're suggesting? That they can't be transferred to third countries unless there is prior authorization of the uh, data providers. Uh, and if that were the case, then basically we would have to uh, c cancel several agreements. Because if that is the case, what we don't have is any sort of... Uh, authority for data supervision because the authority created by the law and data protection is not uh, does not have the competence uh, for that would this be a possible solution i mean that's what i'm aiming for is to get an answer for that i'm sorry but i needed an answer uh, with regard to this uh, clause which i think is extremely important because uh, renewing treaties or renegotiating uh, agreements with the us is not going to change the uh, current provisions i want to hear the other questions as well mr weiden also also ich bin sehr kurz uh Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Very quickly, this morning earlier on, we heard about the Transatlantic Experts Group 
and uh, their role and function. And my question is whether your paper has been put to them as well. Have they received it? Now, secondly, it seems there's a new digital divide, this time between America and the rest of the world. And my question to Mr. Bowden, is this. Do you think that with our data protection package here, we're going to be able to bridge that uh, divide? And what would you regard as being the big um, chunks of uh, overcoming such a divide? Morvai, last, uh, last question. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. I'd like to thank um, you for this. It's very interesting to um, talk to people who have worked with Microsoft for many years. One is interested to see whether software which has been uh, developed, um, are there, are you, do you have to buy software which has been produced locally or are, do you have to buy uh, things which have been made by Microsoft at, uh, for a, a very stiff price? because there are various institutions which have put a lot of business Microsoft's way. And where Microsoft, for example, has got exclusive rights uh, for the administration, whether that's the Justice Department or education. When that has been uh, done, when people have bought job lots of Microsoft's uh, things, does this in itself constitute a danger? This uh, privileged link between uh, Microsoft and uh, nat national intelligence in the US. Um, does this preempt certain things? Does it mean that data is automatically going to be passed on to the uh, US um, secret services, given that Microsoft has that uh, very s distinctive uh, position vis-a-vis -vis, um, governments? If you could just uh, mark our card on that. Um, that was the last speaker, Mr. Bowden. Uh. Well, I think I'll begin, uh, first of all, with um, what powers exist under 9546, under the existing regulation. In my view, um, if we think about safe harbor, uh, da individual data protection authorities already have the uh, full power and indeed quite um, sufficient reason with what's been published and revealed so far to shut down a data flow in any particular country from any particular safe harbor company. They could do that today. Moreover, the Commission uh, also has power and sufficient reason to shut down Safe Harbor itself. Uh, we don't need any further legislation for them to do that. Uh, they could do it tomorrow, and I think they should. Um, similarly, model contracts drafted by the Commission from 2001, they have the power to withdraw and revoke the validity of that today. And again, I think they should do that, because I hope the report has demonstrated why uh, they simply condone unlawful surveillance by a third country's foreign intelligence agency. There's really no doubt about it. So what would that leave? That would leave consent. And this is why I place such emphasis in Article 42 uh, on consent, because if we don't get any other structural agreement with the US, uh, then consent would be all that's left. But if you like, what I'm proposing is a sort of two-fisted strategy that on the one hand, we raise political awareness and we close down the exposure except via fully informed consent. And on the other hand, we build up the prospects and the economic opportunities for a European cloud. And this will have a pincer effect on, we hope, uh, US political and also commercial opinion. So for example, we might see uh, civil liberties organizations and particularly trade bodies, instead of lobbying to wear down and batter down European privacy, we might start to see them, as it were, lobbying the American government for better privacy protection for non-Americans. That's the basic strategic idea. Now, I have to say that we are not being realistic today if we think that in the American public debate, our interests, the interest of Europeans or the rest of the world, is making any impact whatsoever. I have counted the references in very, very close following of the American debate. In the past 10 years, up until about three months ago, and I'm not kidding, there was one 
that I'd actually come across in 10 years of debate in America about the interests of non-Americans. One slight reference in one congressional committee. And then in the past three months, there have been three. There's been one blog commentary by Human Rights Watch, uh, Mr. Nojem's remarks at the Privacy and Civil Liberties uh, Oversight Board, and another very skilled civil liberties lawyer. Nothing in Congress. So we have a lot of work to do, if you like, to represent our European views, and we have to take that to the United States. We have to have parliamentarians, delegations, civil libertarians showing up in TV studios, participating in the US public debate, because frankly, it is still today entirely parochial. Uh, now, point about subcontracting. It's a very technical point, but it's a very important point. If you read, as it were, from the point of view of a company lawyer entering into a cloud processing agreement, where that data is going to go in subprocessing, it's incredibly hard to discern that. And there is a commission project underway to standardize cloud contracts. I won't say more about that, except that it is a very important element of the total solution, and it is a big area of uncertainty at the moment. But in terms of the total solution, it's just like a sort of 10% of the solution we need, but we shouldn't forget it. Um, where else would we got to go? Um, well, we talk, I've mentioned already that data protection authorities have, in my view, uh, considerable discretion to uh, take further enforcement action already. And I think that reminds me of a point that I wanted to make earlier, which is where have data protection authorities and the European Data Protection Supervisor been in this debate so far? I am critical in the report and saying that they did not act at any stage to heed very clear warnings that I and others have given them, both in the time of safe harbor and, uh, of course, subsequently in the last two years. They have been bluntly asleep at the wheel, and I'm prepared to back that up. And I think it would be useful for the committee to invite uh, particular data protection authorities to come and give an account of how they've been considering these issues for the past two years and to justify their inaction because they have taken no action and they have had powers to take action. Now I have, again, not mentioned so far in my recommendations specific ideas for reform of the data protection supervisory arrangements. The idea, perhaps, that there could be a sort of special people's commissioner, perhaps elected with a special mandate to represent uh, individual interest. And I think, uh, diverting, digressing somewhat from the question being put to me, um, there is a glaring deficiency overall in the technical incompetence of data protection authorities. Out of about 2,000 officials working in data protection authorities across Europe, to my knowledge, there are only a few dozen with any technical knowledge whatsoever. And there is nobody, with the exception of one or two, who have a specific postgraduate qualification in the computer science and engineering of privacy. It's rather as if we had designed an organization to do aircraft airworthiness inspection, and instead of staffing it with engineers, we'd staffed it with 99% officials, bureaucrats. Nobody would think that's a good idea, yet that is the situation we have in data protection regulation. So my modest proposal is that we should have a quota. It's a blunt instrument, but I can't think of any other way to do it, where data protection authorities should have to have 25% well-qualified people on their staff with a career track to senior positions. The problem is that serious, it's that broken, and you just have to look at the track record of inaction to see how broken it is. Uh, now, going back to the questions I was asked, um, oh, the, um, the report, have I given it to the transatlantic expert group? I'm afraid not, because I don't know who the transatlantic expert group is. We don't know, the names are not public. Um, I, I, I believe Mr. Nemitz has seen a copy of my report, and no doubt he will see that it gets to the other members of the group. Uh, but perhaps it's something to be regretted in general that with this and previous expert groups, we don't know who these people are and we don't know, as it were, their background and their expertise. And that might be rather a good thing uh, for future. Um, regarding uh, the question of Microsoft's role in the cloud industry uh, particularly and software lock-in, I think is what you were hinting at, uh, yes, it's absolutely true that going back to around 2008, 2009, uh, in a sense, Microsoft's urgency about the cloud, which of course I was working there at the time and I saw real up close, it was very adjacent to my job. Uh, the reason Microsoft put such a big emphasis on the cloud is they wanted to migrate their customers to their cloud before the competition. 
because by migrating their customers to their cloud, they would preserve the standards lock-in from the particular fiddly bits of their software and the licensing terms which would carry on that business for them and make it hard for customers to switch away. Uh, there is no defense of this. There should be much more vigorous policy to stop that kind of standards lock-in, and there's still a lot of naivety uh, and lack of awareness in the competition regulators to prevent the kind of strategy gains that are used to preserve lock-in. Um, another point that I think I should go back to is whistleblowers, which I didn't address in the first round of questions. Uh, it's, um, I think some will recall that back in February, after I gave a presentation, I was asked to produce some recommendations on particularly whistleblowers, and indeed there have been some amendments tabled already, uh, which I guess will be coming up for consideration in October. Um, those amendments are okay. I did actually propose a stronger package back in February, and I'm proposing strengthening it further still. There is a complication, I believe, in that it is quite hard to guarantee somebody uh, asylum and legal immunity under a data protection law. Uh, and it is a pity, I believe, that there's just been a package on asylum which was closed and finalized recently, and that would have been an ideal place to put in explicit uh, whistleblower protections which would help here. Um, all I can say is I think that it will take quite a lot of ingenuity and careful legal study to make sure those whistleblower protections are watertight, because what the point is, is, is we cannot rely on future whistleblowers to be as altruistic as Edward Snowden. They may be uh, motivated by a reward. They are going to be likely to be citizens of the United States. They could be persecuted and uh, uh, sought by United States authorities for the rest of their lives, you know, subject to rendition and kidnapping and going through airports and so forth. So they're going to need a big, big paycheck, both to live their lives semi-normally for the rest of their lives uh, after taking that momentous decision. But we have to create a credible deterrent. Only by creating a credible deterrent that a whistleblower might emerge is the United States likely to believe that it's not worth trying to engage in those activities. Thank you. I believe Mrs. Morify uh, would like to come back very briefly. Yeah, yeah, Please. yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm sure that it was not the translation, but uh, nevertheless, my question was probably misunderstood. So let me rephrase uh, uh, it in English. So my question was whether or not there is a danger that if Microsoft uh, software is used by governments in their, uh, I don't know, public administration, justice, and so on and so forth, can the NSA, basically to put it very straightforward, spy on that given government through the Microsoft system, through the back doors that we know about. And because we know about the okay, agreement okay. between Microsoft and NSA, does it mean that if a government uses explicitly Microsoft softwares, uh, okay. is that government vulnerable I, to spying? I think, Thank I think you. the question is clear. Mr. Bowden? Well, it's a complicated question to answer. I can give you the short answer, which is that I don't trust Microsoft software anymore. I cleaned out all Microsoft software from my own systems over 15 years, and I now run 100% free software. From a government's perspective, uh, yes, I think there is much more reason to worry about Microsoft software than free and open source software, but it's quite a long explanation why. Often the things that people think are backdoors in Microsoft software are not actually the backdoors. The real mechanisms for providing backdoors are much more subtle, but would take longer to explain. Okay, thank you. Um, that brings us to the, uh, to the end of this session. Thank you very much for sharing all your expertise with us. Um, the last part of the